Welcome everyone to our webinar today. Thank you for joining us. We're going to wait a couple of minutes uh, for everyone who has signed up to join us today to be able to do so. We have participants from all around the world, very, very different time zones. So I know some of you are waking up right now. Some of you may be already in bed, ready to sleep. So um, thank you for joining us if you are you know, uh, getting up early or staying awake later than normal to hear from us. So I'm going to wait, wait a couple of minutes uh, to start formally. Whilst we wait to start the presentation, I'm going to use this time to give some housekeeping or ground rules about today's webinar for your information. So we are recording today's webinar. We will be posting the video in our Coach University International Admissions YouTube channel so that you can watch it anytime afterwards and you can share it with any interested friends. You will also receive the video recording link via email um, two days after today. So by yeah, by Monday, um, so keep that in mind. Your microphones are going to be muted, but you will be able to ask your questions by typing them on the Q&A button that you see on your screen. We also have a chat section, but we kindly ask you to use the Q&A because that way it's gonna be easier for us to keep track of your questions and answer them in order. You can ask your questions in English or Turkish because um, we also have Turkish participants with us today. Çok teşekkürler. Uh, thank you for joining us. Uh, we really have participants from all over, <laughs> all over um, the world, which is it's a very nice thing. So I think we're now at three o three, and we can get started. So to introduce myself, um, I'm Melissa Abache. I'm the director of international student recruitment at Koç University in Istanbul, Turkey. I'm going to be starting the presentation and I'm very happy to have here with me today to do the most important part of today really is uh, Mrs. Maria Kirilova. She's the manager for Europe, Middle East and Asia in client relations for GRE at ETS Global. Um, if you want to say hello, Maria, you can unmute yourself if you want. Hello everyone and thank you, Melissa, so much for having me. It's, it's our pleasure, really. So let's go over today's agenda. I'm going to give a brief overview about Koch University, especially for those of you who may not be very familiar with our institution. And I'm going to be focusing on our research strengths as a university because we, I think all of you are considering applying for graduate programs at Koch University or as well as other universities. I will talk briefly about the student experience here as a graduate student and give a quick um, overview of the programs that we offer. Then we're gonna look at our graduate admissions in terms of the overall approach, like what is our what are our aims in terms of our master and PhD programs, the application and admission requirements, some of the common problems that our applicants typically face and that we hear about and solutions for that. Within that, I'm going to spend about uh, five, eight minutes talking about how do we use grades and more specifically, how do we use um, international uh, graduate admission exams like the GRE in part in, in the evaluation of applicants. How, um, does they, how does this approach differ between our graduate schools and even between faculty members? Then I'm going to hand over to Maria, who is going to then go in depth um, about the GRE test. Some of you, again, may be familiar, you may have already taken the test or be preparing to take the test, but some of you, this may be the first time that you are hearing about it. So that's a great way to start. So we're, you know, Maria is going to look at, um, you know, an overview of the test, uh, tips about how to register for it, uh, different strategies that you can take in terms of preparing for it and doing the best um, you, know, you can in the test, how to um, get and send your scores, 
and all of the free tools, and this is really important, all of the free tools that um, are at your disposal to prepare. There's also a bit about sample questions that I hope we will have time to do because um, I'm really excited about that. I think we can make it um, interactive a bit, uh, that part of the webinar. And then we should have 10 to 15 minutes to answer all of your questions. So again, I ask you to please type those questions in the Q&A section. You can start typing your questions throughout the presentation and we will wait until the end to answer all of those. Um, I think that's, yes, that's the overview for today. So, uh, Coach University, I hope some of you have heard about our university. For, for those of you who haven't, basically we are a little gem <laughs> in the region, you know, we're, uh, you know, and, a uh, gem to be discovered is how I like to call our university. We were set up in 1993, so we're still relatively young as a higher education institution, and we were set up from the beginning to become a center of excellence that would provide world-class education, would create new knowledge, and benefit society. And I think we are, you know, already demonstrating all of those three kind of key components in terms of our teaching, our research, and the quality of students and faculty that we have. How does this um, relate to you as a, as a future graduate student? So Coach University is also a small university in terms of its student body. We have a total of 8,000 students. Out of those 8,000, 1,300 are graduate students. These are master and PhD students. And importantly, almost 20% of those graduate students are international that are coming from 50 different countries. Each year, the number of countries increases. So that's a very, um, encouraging sign for us that we are increasing our diversity in terms of nationalities in our campus. So as a graduate student, when you join Koch University, you would be in one specific program, either a PhD or a master's with thesis or master non-thesis program in one of the four graduate schools. And I will show those graduate schools and the programs that we offer shortly after. As a graduate student, then you would also have access to the 223 research laboratories that we have, especially if you're coming to our basic sciences, engineering or health sciences uh, programs. And you would also have access to one of our 23 research centers or five research and education forums. More, you know, more important, I think, than the, the infrastructure that we have for research are our professors. These are the people that you will be spending a lot of time in terms of classroom teaching and um, doing research with. So right now we have 521 full-time faculty. Once you check our graduate school websites and the program that you're interested in, you will see the quality of faculty members that we have in terms of their previous training at some of the top Ivy League and you know, top ranked universities around the world. A lot of them are coming from the United States, from the UK, from Europe, from Asia. So we really have a variety of, of training and teaching styles and approaches in our university. All of that combined results in some key kind of indicators that can tell you the quality of, uh, or the experience you can expect here. When we look at research at Coach University uh, in terms of how is, it, how is it recognized, right? Right now in Turkey, um, we hold 20 out of the 36 European Research Council grants in the whole country. If you're not familiar with European Research Council grants, these are extremely competitive grants because it's individual researchers who apply to it and they can come from, from all over Europe. So when you compare, uh, let's say in, in molecular biology that you're competing with researchers at huge universities in the UK, in Germany, in like in powerhouses, let's say, or traditional powerhouses of research, the fact that we're hosting that large number and, and the majority of them in Turkey, it's a good indicator of, of our faculty members, I think. We're also the top recipient of national research awards um, and the high, you know, our university has the highest number of publications per faculty mem member in Turkey in top scientific publications. So these are publications outside of Turkey. We also have a lot of support that you as a graduate student can benefit from in terms of technology transfer, if you're interested in the commercialization of your research, whether it's basic or applied research. And um, we also have an incubation center for our students and alumni that you can join anytime. 
there are specific areas in research in which we have become, um, I wouldn't say world leaders, but we're getting there. You know, slowly, slowly, we are now, we have a, at least a regional competitive advantage in terms of the impact that our research in those areas is having. So as you can see on that list, uh, it goes from the basic sciences in medicine, in energy, in computer science, as well as social sciences and humanities. One reason many international graduate students come from us is because of the location of Turkey in relation to its region and, and its neighbors. So for example, migration research is a, it's a very, very strong area at Koch University, as well as archeology span and art history. Psychology and neuroscience is also a very strong um, research kind of advantage of our university. Here, I wanted to just show um, some images. The, the image at the bottom is from our Infectious Diseases Research Center. That's a newly established center uh, two years ago. And they're incredibly active in those two years. Um, I invite you to check their website. On the top picture, uh, I, you know, uh, it's showing Professor Alper Uzun from our chemical and biological engineering department with one of his PhD students from China. They won a lot of awards recently for a paper that they published and uh, basically doing very innovative uh, things in their specific disciplines. Um, when we look at, yes, impact of research, there are you know, very objective ways to, of looking at this. So as I was mentioning, nearly 80% of our university's publications are in the top uh, quartiles of journals, um, in scientific journals worldwide. And very importantly, uh, nearly 43% yeah, of those publications are done with international collaboration. As a student, that matters a lot because it means that you have access to knowledge and, and, and collaborations with professors, not only at Koch University, but all around the world. When it comes to the student experience, this is one of my favorite pictures of our university. I feel like we're, we're kind of a Hogwarts of Istanbul. Uh, we are located in the European side of Istanbul. Istanbul is often referred as a city that connects East and West because half of the city is on the Asian continent and the other half is on the European continent. So we are located on the European side very close, about 15 minutes by car, to the Black Sea. So that's the, the blue, you know, amazing nice blue that you see at the, you know, in the horizon behind our campus. Um, our campus offers a full residential experience. So we have campus dormitories, both in the main campus, as well as on our West Campus nearby. We have a Coach University Hospital. That's where our School of Medicine and our Reddit School of Health Sciences is located. And we also offer all of the facilities that you would expect from a world-class university in terms of sports, in terms of um, you know, health center for any medical emergencies, on-campus facilities for eating, for shopping, everything is basically there. It's located about one hour by public transport, transport from Taksim, which if you have ever been to Istanbul, you may have heard this a lot. This is a commercial, let's say, downtown area of the city. Istanbul is a very big city of 15, depending on who you <laughs> believe, between 15 and 17 million people. So there are several downtown areas. So um, we are about one hour from uh, one of them. Life as a graduate student here is not all about your research and your courses. It's very intense and very challenging, yes, but it's also full of opportunities to meet people from Turkey as well as from other countries in outside, you know, outside the classroom. So, uh, you know, these are examples from some of our students in our master's in international management or master's in finance. Uh, we have, these are students, I think, from our cybersecurity program meeting with one of the professors. Uh, one of our, you know, some of our students who joined the ballet classes. So again, there's a lot of different options to enjoy your time outside of classes. And of course, one of the biggest uh, attractions for graduate students to come to Koch University is the fact of, you know, being able to live in Istanbul for one year, two years, or four years, depending on the length of your program. As I said, Istanbul is a very large uh, cosmopolitan and dense city that offers everything you may want in terms of shopping, nightlife, culture, um, everything you can think of, you can almost find here. Public transport is also a strength of the city considering the size and the pace of growth. It has very good 
public transport networks to move around. You do not need a car uh, if you're a student at Coach University and to enjoy the, the city. I'm, I'm gonna be, keep it brief, but I could talk for an hour <laughs> about Istanbul. So uh, in terms of the graduate programs that we offer at Coach University, we have research-based or oriented programs. So these are master with thesis and our PhD programs. Our master with thesis programs have a duration of two years in which the first year is courses and the second year may be a couple more courses, some elective courses, and you are writing a thesis or a dissertation under the supervision of a faculty member. In the case of our PhD programs, they have a duration of four years, but typically our students would finish them in five or six, six years, depending on the research you're doing. And they include one or one and a half year of courses, then a PhD qualifying exam. And after passing that exam, then your time is fully devoted to doing research again, you know, with the supervision of a faculty member, and you usually would be part of a group or a laboratory. On the screen, you can see the programs that we offer in our graduate school of sciences and engineering and in our graduate school of health sciences. You can also find this information, of course, on our website and you can explore each program in terms of what are the courses, who are the faculty members, what are the research uh, focus areas for each program and specific or individual application requirements. Now here you can see the research based programs in our graduate school of business, which is only our PhD in business administration, and then our master and PhD programs in the graduate school of social sciences and humanities. This is one of our graduate schools that has been constantly growing in terms of adding new programs. Uh, last year, we launched two very exciting programs, I think, which is a master's in computational social sciences and a master's in comparative literature. There was a lot of demand for these two programs and also in clinical psychology, which is not mentioned here and I will explain why. Now we have another type of master programs which are non-thesis masters. These are completed in one year typically and do not require you to write a thesis. You do have a final project, but you don't have to go into the, the, the process of writing a, a whole thesis. So these are the programs that you can see here. We have a lot of interest, of course, in uh, very hot, let's say hot topics like data science, cybersecurity, as well as programs like global health for people who are interested in, in development studies and of course, uh, public health. And we have programs that host a lot of international students, um, traditionally, such as our LLM, or Master's in Law, in public or private law. Okay, so now I'm going to go into our graduate admissions process. So as a university, um, we have excellent faculty members. They are, you know, all the time coming up with new ideas and new projects of research that they want to do. So we need to find students, master and PhD students who are going to help them achieve those research goals that they that they have. That's one of our needs. The second need is that we want to make sure that we're attracting outstanding students academically, uh, both from Turkey and from outside of Turkey. With Turkey, there's a bit of a challenge because usually our best students, they want to go abroad, of course, and we're trying to say, you know, you have a very, very good option here as well. You don't necessarily need to go abroad. And of course, what we want to do is make sure that we retain those students and that they graduate and they become you know, top scientists in their fields and they can help to create impact in academia if they decide to become professors or uh, lecturers in industry, in government or in wider society. And I think we have been uh, showing that it's possible. We are now graduating the largest number of PhD students in, in Turkey. And what we're most proud of is that a lot of those students are now, for example, lecturers and assistant professors at Turkish universities. So this is direct impact in, in our society. But those who prefer to go abroad after the program, for example, master students that complete their master with thesis, are then finding really good PhD positions at top universities like Harvard, MIT, Oxford, Cambridge, uh, Stanford. So this is something that um, our faculty members and our graduate schools are also very proud of. When we look at the whole process of admissions, the first thing to know is that most of our graduate students enter the university for the fall semester. Fall semester in Turkey means September. That's when it starts. Usually it's mid to end September. There are some programs for which there are spring admissions, and I will show a slide where we can see the, the breakdown of which 
which graduate schools have spring admissions, but all of our graduate schools for sure have um, intakes for the fall period. The deadlines, the last days to apply, will vary across programs and they would be between May and July. Some programs close their applications fairly early in, um, towards the end of May, so you need to make sure that you're checking in advance the, the graduate school website so that you don't miss that deadline. The whole application process is done online. There's no need to be sending any documents via post or any other means to the university. We have an online application system. The address is apply.ku.edu.tr. Um, and all of the documents are submitted there and um, basically you're evaluated there and you, you can see the status of your application and the results of your application in there as well. There is no application fee for our graduate programs except for our business school. So if you're applying for an MBA, master's in finance, master's in management, there is an application fee for those programs, but for any others, there isn't. Finally, this is what I'm gonna spend more time talking about today, which is our admissions process is selective and holistic. Selective because we do receive thousands of applications um, you know, as a, as a whole for all of our graduate programs. Some graduate programs specifically receive by just themselves like around 5,000 applications. And of course, there's limited capacity in terms of how many students or faculty members can supervise each year. We don't want to overburden our faculty members and, and uh, you know, and not give that quality of supervision to our students. So it is very competitive in terms of being admitted. Um, and in terms of how you're evaluated as an applicant, it is done in a holistic way. So I'm gonna go into a bit more depth about what that means. Just before, uh, this is how our different, our four graduate schools um, divide their admissions. So some of them like sciences and engineering have both spring and fall admissions. Social sciences has only some programs for the spring and all other programs for fall. And our business school and our health sciences graduate schools, they only admit students for the fall. What happens after you submit an application? This is a question we often receive is um, that your application, in case there's no missing documents or um, information, would be evaluated in around a month. Um, then a short list is made of candidates that will then be invited to an interview. And for some programs, they also have a written exam uh, that can be done here on our campus or online. The interview can also be done in person or online. So after you are invited to take that exam or that interview or both, then you receive an offer a couple of weeks later, and then you're invited to register or enroll as a new student in September. So if after submitting your application, um, you know, we have reached the application deadline date, for example, 1st of June, let's say, um, if after three or four, after a month, you have not heard back from the relevant graduate school, uh, you can assume that you will not have been successful and you have been rejected for the program and you will receive a rejection email fairly, you know, like a couple of months later, but you can also check the status on the application system. If you're contacted, for the interview, that's great. That, that's a positive, let's say, um, uh, sign. And you, you just need to make sure that you prepare well for the interview and if, if it applies to you for the written exam. So what do we mean by holistics? You know, some, some of you may be familiar with this, some of you uh, may not. So that's why I wanted to clarify it. What, what, you know, holistic admissions is typically or broadly understood as, you know, assessing a candidate on a broad range of criteria um, that can include their academic performance, extracurricular activities, skills, previous experience, and non-cognitive traits, or, you know, some could generalize this into soft skills. What it means is that, you know, for us as a university, your grades from your bachelor's degree or master's degree are not the only indicator of your potential to do well in the program that you're applying to um, or your ability to cope with the courses that you will have as part of your curriculum. Um, this is something that, you know, it's not unique to Coach University, of course, most of the selective, uh, you know, admission universities around the world, especially in the US, um, they apply a similar approach. And, you know, the, this is a survey that was done of about 200 different graduate schools around the US about 
what criteria they take into account in their admissions process. And of course, grades and test scores are a very important part for all of them. However, you know, you can see that there are other elements like recommendation letter, essays, interviews, uh, work samples that play a role. What all of these different application requirements are trying to really um, help faculty members with is to assess if you have a good fit for the program, again, in terms of academic preparedness and ability to cope with the programs, chemistry, this is a very vague term, but what it means is you're going to be spending a lot of time with a professor and a group or a lab you know, group, um, and they want to see if your personality essentially kind of um, blends well with the professor and the group. That's usually best assessed through the interviews. And of course, your potential to use that degree to the best you know, um, way possible. Like that's where they assess what are your career goals? Like what do you want to obtain by doing a master's or PhD degree at our university? When we look at Coach University specifically, I think I have five minutes. Okay, so I, I wanna keep it to, to, to time. You see on the screen our, our graduate admission requirements. This may vary according to the program. So again, please make sure that you check the specific program website to see if there are any extra requirements. There are some programs that do not need you to provide, for example, a, a admission test. This would be mostly for our non-thesis master programs. But for our research masters and our PhDs, typically these are the things you would be asked to provide. Um, as I said, those who are shortlisted then are also asked to do an interview and in some cases a written exam. When you look at this screen, the things that take usually the most time to prepare for are the English proficiency test because all of our programs are offered in English. So we need to make sure that you can you know, understand the courses and communicate uh, properly with, the, with your classmates and the professor. And a graduate admission test score. Typically we can accept GRE, GMAT for uh, Turkish applicants, you can also apply with your ALIS test score. Um, and again, most of our applicants are, are submitting their applications with GRE. Only in the business school, they may also accept GMAT. So this is so that you know. Now, the, the way that grades and GRE test scores are used, it varies across our graduate schools and even within departments or programs. There are some graduate schools, like the, the Graduate School of Social Sciences and Humanities, in which they, from the start, they say, we do have some cutoff or minimum scores for GRE. Let's say, for example, here, this is an example of a program in which you should have, if you're applying for a master program, for example, you should have at least 149 points on the quantitative analysis section of the GRE. So that means that if you have a score of 149 or higher and your bachelor degree grade point average is higher than 2.5 as you see on the table then you will be selected for the first evaluation that means that then your application will be checked and then they will check your cv your motivation letter um, your recommendation letter and you know based on the quality of those then they would invite you for an interview if you are below that cutoff score, it doesn't mean you're not going to be evaluated, but it means that you will be put at the, let's say at the back of the, of the queue to be checked after everyone else who was above the minimum has been evaluated um, and, and a decision on those candidates has been made. That's why it's so important that you, first that you should apply with the test scores and of course your transcripts to show your, your bachelor degree GPA, uh, but with a score above the minimum. The benefit of this type of approach is that um, it helps to be a bit fair in that for faculty members, because they receive applications from many, many different countries, many, many different institutions, they don't have the knowledge to know what, you know, in your country, what is the best university in that country or what university is considered to be very good at a specific discipline, for example, in chemical engineering or in uh, the humanities in general. So, because they don't have that information for every country, they want to use a standard measure that will also reduce subconscious bias. So they want to evaluate all candidates on the same basis of a test and their academic performance throughout an undergraduate degree. 
And yes, yeah, so this is just to summarize, what they're trying to do is to look at your grades to see what could be your possible future academic su success based on the courses you have taken, what is your foundation in specific areas of knowledge. And they want to use the GRE test scores to, to predict somehow your academic performance. There are other graduate schools, for example, in our case in Quach University, like our graduate school of sciences and engineering or our graduate school of health sciences, that they do not specify a minimum or cutoff score for the GRE or for your GPA, because uh, they have a different approach, as, as, as it says here. You know, you may have, let's say, uh, you know, a somewhat low GPA, but you have a lot of practical research experience where you have gained very valuable lab skills. Um, then that makes you, you know, a higher candidate in their ranking, in their pool of candidates that they're evaluating. Or you may have a GRE score that it's in the quantitative section, for example, that it's not very high, but again, there's something else in your application that it's outstanding or that it's particularly valuable to their specific lab or group. And that's why they're gonna shortlist you for interview. So this is why I mean that different graduate schools and professors you know, use grades and test scores in slightly different ways. Um, the, the, um, in the case of uh, social sciences, for example, you will see that most of our programs, they, they do specify a cutoff score on the GRE, as well as on the ALICE, the Turkish um, graduate admissions test. Um, and they're gonna be looking at all sections, not only the quantitative analysis section, but also the critical thinking and the kind of reading and writing uh, skills section. So finally, uh, these are some of the common problems related to transcripts and test scores that we face, you know, that we keep hearing about from our applicants and some of our suggested solutions that I hope will be useful to you. Uh, typically, for example, there may be some countries where your official university transcripts may not be available by uh, the program application deadline. If it's in July, you may receive your diploma plus your transcripts after July. That's okay, you can upload the latest version of official transcripts that you can have. If they don't include your senior year, your last year at university or just the first semester, that's okay. You just need to make sure that you make notes on the application to explain this. As long as you can explain what is the specific barrier or challenge that you have, uh, that's usually okay in terms of the faculty members looking at your file. Another common problem is because we do request two or three recommendation letters for master and for PhD programs. Sometimes your referees may forget, you know, they may not find the email from the system, they it may have gone to spam, they deleted it by mistake. So it's very important that you remind your referees to submit their recommendations as soon as possible, uh, not too, too late after the program deadline. Now, the ones that you see on red here on the screen, uh, are very specific situations that we have faced a lot in the past few years, of course, which is, uh, for example, that there are no GRE or TOEFL test centers in your country, or there's no available test dates. That's okay. You just need to provide an explanation about the specific situation in the scores part of your application. In that case, um, basically, you know, you would be asked to provide that test score once you arrive in Turkey, if you are offered admission. Or, for example, you took the GRE and the TOEFL tests, and uh, but, you know, you took it almost like the day before our deadline, let's say, so you're not going to have the, the test scores uh, soon. So again, just keep, you know, make sure that you have all of that information on the application form to indicate what was your test date? Um, and as soon as you receive them, upload them and inform the graduate school of the program you're applying to via email to let them know you have uploaded this document, this missing document. Finally, um, you, you may be joining us today and you realize I really want to apply to a PhD at Koch University, but the deadline is, you know, in two months, that's not enough time for me to prepare for the GRE because I'm also completing my thesis, I'm working right now or whatever other reason, that's okay. You know, you just need to plan ahead and you can plan to apply in our next admission period. 
our, you know, our scholarships and everything good <laughs> about Quich University that we offer to Turkish and international graduate um, students is not going to go away. So, of course, you know, that's what it's, it's best to, it's better, sorry, to apply uh, for next year or the next intake than applying with missing documents this year and possibly be rejected. Okay, so now I'm going to stop sharing my screen. I hope the information I have given you has been useful. And I just went a bit like five minutes, I think, <laughs> over our plan time. So I'm now going to ask Maria to share her screen. And this is a really exciting part about today, I think. So we're all gonna learn a bit more about the GRE test. So over to you, Maria. Excellent, thank you so much, Melissa, for the very informative first section of this webinar. Um, and welcome everybody once again uh, to the GRE section um, of this webinar today. I would like to extend one more time my gratitude to Melissa and everybody at the Koch Graduate University for giving us the chance to speak with you today um, and tell you a little bit more about the GRE. We have a lot of ground to cover on our webinar today. Um, Apologies, my slides. Okay, here we go. So this is the agenda for today. As you can see, it's quite a lot. Um, I'll provide an overview of the GRE general test, give you some registration tips and tips and strategies to be successful on your test day. Um, I'll give you tips on getting and sending your scores. I'll give you information on the tools that can help you prepare. And I'll leave you with some GRE resources. Um, as Melissa mentioned earlier in the introduction, um, I have a, a couple of sample questions from the real test. I really hope we'll have some time at the end of the webinar to go over them. Um, now, because we have so much to go over, I'll try and uh, speak quite quickly. If I don't cover something you're interested in, uh, please drop your questions in the Q&A box and I'll try and get to as many as I can at the end of this webinar. Even if we go a little bit over time uh, from my side, that's not a problem. Um, and also remember that we are recording this webinar. So if I go through a section too quickly, you can always come back to the recording um, and uh, pause it or uh, you know read the information more in detail. So let's dive straight into the overview of the GRE test. So what is the GRE test? The graduate records exam, which the abbreviation stands for, is used around the world. And it is used for all kinds of graduate programs. So we're talking about master programs, for example, in engineering. Uh, we're talking about specialized masters in business programs, for example, master in international management, uh, law programs, MBA programs, doctoral programs, as well as programs that allow scholarships. So you can take one test and use it for all of these programs in case you haven't decided, for example, between an MBA or a specialized master in business, you can take one test and it's valid for both of these options. And the good thing uh, for you is that the scores are valid for five years. So if your plans change, if something in your intention changes, you have these five years uh, leeway time to, to make up your mind and choose uh, the best program for your uh, situation. Uh, now, a little bit about our uh, test center network. In most regions of the world, the test is available on a continuous basis throughout the year. It's delivered on a, a desktop computer with a full screen, mouse, etc. All of these things we're used to using in our daily life. Um, and the test is normally available at more than 1,000 test centers in more than 160 countries. Now, uh, Melissa has been very kind to offer me to share with you these links that I'm sharing in the PowerPoint in the chat box, so they will come through to you at some point. Um, if you wanted to have a look at where the test is available, I saw already some questions in the chat box, so I really hope this is helpful. If not, if not just uh, let me know. 
Um, something else I wanted to mention is the availability of the GRE at home. Uh, this is something that we offered in a response to the global health crisis with COVID-19. Uh, a lot of our test centers, as you can probably uh, guess, were closed. So we came up with a solution which is available online and you can take it from home. It's available all over the world with the exception of Iran. Um, and the test is identical, is the same content, the same scores, the same price, the same options, and so on. So I just wanted to leave you with this information so you keep it at the back of your, at the back of your mind as a plan B um, in case uh, you want to uh, consider it. Also, it's very important, check the website of the specific university that you're applying with, because some of them may be accepting the GRE at home while others might still prefer the test center option. So always just read the requirements uh, carefully to avoid um, uh, disappointment. Uh, and now this is a little bit about the test. So as you can see on the left-hand side, the GRE general test has three sections. It's testing your analytical writing abilities, ver verbal reasoning, and quantitative reasoning. The analytical writing has one section and two tasks in total with 30 minutes per task. So that's an hour in total of writing. Uh, uh, tasks. The verbal reasoning and the quantitative reasoning each have two sections with 20 questions per section and 30 or 35 minutes per section. Uh, I know this is kind of a lot, but we're going to break it down a little bit in the next uh, uh, slide. Um, uh, this brings the total duration of the exam to three hours and 45 minutes. You have a short break in between, uh, but it's an intense exam and that's why it's always so important to prepare on time. And I will also give you some tips, as I said, uh, later in the presentation. So here we're coming to the first section, the analytical writing section. So what exactly will you be asked to do? As I mentioned, you have two tasks, to analyze an issue, which requires you to provide arguments and reasons, as well as examples to support your position. The analyze an argument is slightly different. You're given an argument and you're required to assess the logical soundness of a given argument according to the specific directions. So both of those are in an essay format. You will be typing them on a computer and so on. Something else I wanted to give you a tip of. All of, our, all of our analytical writing section tips, all of our prompts, everything you can expect to see on the exam, it's available online. It's a very long list, uh, so it would be incredible if you're really able to go over all of them, but we publish all of our prompts. The idea is not to uh, surprise you. We want to, we understand this is already a stressful time, a stressful exam. We want to help as much as possible. So head on to the GRE website and find all these prompts so you can uh, prepare uh, for this section and more. Now I'm jumping to the verbal reasoning section, which is the next uh, uh, part of the exam. As I mentioned earlier, it has two sections and it assesses your ability to understand what you read and how you apply your reasoning skills. The question types include reading comprehension where you will have multiple choices. And I think one of the sample questions I have at the end may be uh, from the verbal reasoning. I hope we have the time. Uh, selecting passage. So you have to select the, the best word, the best uh, fit for the passage. Text completion or sentence equivalence. Pretty much this um, tests your ability when you go to graduate school to be able to understand the literature, to be able to assimilate and reproduce the the literature that you are given uh, during your coursework. Um, and now we are coming to the last section of the GRE test, the quantitative reasoning. Again, here you will have two sections. Um, and this particular part assesses your ability to interpret and analyze quantitative information and solve problems using, using mathematical models. Uh, the question types, again, you have multiple choice, numeric entry, and the skills um, that are uh, really uh, tested or where the focus is, 
is from these uh, mathematical concepts, arithmetics, algebra, geometry, and data analysis. Uh, you see on the right-hand side, the on-screen calculator that's available to you throughout your, uh, actually throughout your whole exam, but it's probably going to come handy only at the quantitative reasoning section. Again, we are not um, uh, trying to make it harder for you, and we are not really trying to check if you can calculate. Uh, we're trying to see are are you able to make decisions based on quantitative information? Because for some of your graduate programs, especially those with more quantitative uh, orientation, they would be absolutely crucial for your success. And this is what the test is uh, also testing. Um, key. Um, now I wanted to show you, this is pretty much a screen capture of what the exam looks like. Uh, and one of the specific things about the GRE exams is that the design is very test taker friendly. You can see in the parts that are circled, we allow you to go back and forth within a section. So for example, you see a question that's very, very difficult and you really don't know where to start. You can go to the next question. And then when you have the time, you can come back and answer that question. The other way around, if you prefer to answer first the difficult questions and then the hard ones, that's absolutely up to you, but you have the freedom to select that. Well, uh, that's not always possible with, with other exams. You also can mark the question, right? If you find it too difficult, you mark it just to make sure that you remember which question you have to come back to, the calculator, which I showed you, and so on and so forth. Um, also, one last thing, the timer. So a lot of people we have noticed and gotten feedback that they get nervous when the time is ticking down. So that's up to you again. You can hide or um, allow the timer to be visible. So then you can, um, uh, you know, orient yourself how you're pacing throughout the sections of the test. So this is a little bit about the design. Now I'll give you a couple of registration tips. The first one, of course, is register early, especially when we're talking about the test center capacity when you take the GRE at a test center. The spaces are limited. Uh, so make sure uh, you register early to get your preferred testing location, date, and time. Um, and then once you have registered for the test, you can start working backwards with your preparation. Uh, you know how much time you have and how many hours per day or week uh, you can dedicate for your preparation, but this is really, really a key. Uh, the link to register is ets.org slash mygre. Uh, when you create your ETS account, this is where a lot of things will happen. So this is where you register for the test. This is where you get your scores. This is where you send your scores to your universities. This is where you access preparation as well. So I advise you from now, keep it safe, bookmark it, uh, you know, make sure you remember your login details, et cetera, et cetera, just to ensure that you have a smooth experience with your registration. Um, it's also something very important, and I'm sure those of you who are considering registering for the test, you will go over this whole information. Uh, the ID requirements are quite strict. So um, please in ensure that the name you use when registering for the test is exactly the same match with your ID document. Um, this is important because when you show up uh, on your test date, you will be asked to provide your ID to identify yourself uh, and everything must be an exact match. This is very important. If you make a mistake, you can contact us before the exam, but please be careful because this is something that um, it's, um, it's sensitive and we have seen some uh, students uh, struggling uh, with that. Once you have um, created your ETS account, this is what it looks like, a very uh, standard page. When you click on the blue register button, this is where you can select your test center and your test uh, time. Uh, also, this is where you can register for the at home edition for those of you that are considering this option. Uh, now, some tips and strategies uh, for you uh, that I wanted to leave you with. Um, first of all, as I mentioned earlier, you can approach the test using more of your own test taking strategies. 
you can change your answers. So if you're not sure about something you marked, you can always go back and change it. You can skip questions, you can navigate freely. Uh, GRE research from ETA shows that most GRE test takers boosted scores when changing answers. So this is something to consider. Um, other tips that I wanted to give you is before the test, become familiar with the question formats, because the last thing you want to be doing on your test day is to be wondering, uh, you know, am I supposed to be answering with one or two right questions? Am I supposed to be, um, uh, you know, um, selecting from the passage or what is this prompt really asking me? Really? Be, become familiar. There's plenty of resources that I'll point you with, uh, so you don't have to worry about that. It's one less stress for you. Um, again, be aware of the time on the test, whether you prefer to hide the timer or make it visible, that's up to you, but be aware that the time uh, is of essence. Uh, make sure you understand each question. This is a common issue we see. Uh, sometimes test takers assume that they know what the question is asking them. So that's why please always read the questions until the end to make sure you don't make a necessary uh, mistake. Um, answer every question, even if you have to make a best guess. And I'll tell you in a little bit why. Uh, and use knowledge you have to figure out the answers to unfamiliar questions. Um, do not waste time on questions you find extremely difficult since no question carries greater weight than any other. So the easy questions or the difficult questions, they all have the same weight. So be uh, smart with your time. Uh, do not spend too much time on the review screen. So this is where, where you mark all the uh, questions that you maybe didn't answer or wanted to come back to. It's easy to get carried away and spend a lot of time there. So be mindful of that and check that screen before you submit, before you finish uh, your test to make sure that you have answered all the questions. Um, now I'm jumping to getting and sending your scores. So these are again the three sections we discussed already, and this is what you should expect to see on your uh, score reports. The analytical writing is scored from uh, zero to six. So you may see a score of uh, 3.5 or four or 4.5, and the verbal reasoning and quantitative reasoning are scored um, between 130 and 170 in one point increment. So you may see 148, 152, whatever the case might be. Um, then when you are done with your GRE general test on the test day, so you have just finished your test, you will be shown these unofficial scores. We show you the unofficial scores for the verbal reasoning and the quantitative reasoning, because these two particular sections are actually scored by a reader, e -reader. this is a, a scoring machine. And the reason we show you this course is because we want to uh, inform you to the best of our ability, whether you have done well on your score, uh, on your test, excuse me, or not so well. Um, and why this is important is because the next step of the test is going to ask you to designate the institutions that you want to send your scores to. So in your test fee, you already have included four score reports. So you can select four different universities or four different programs. Some universities have different codes. I'll show you in a minute for different programs. Um, so make sure you make use of them if you're happy with your score. Uh, this is what it looks like. So this is then the following screen after you have seen your uh, unofficial scores and you can add the score recipients. Um, for example, you can select Turkey and you can see here the list of institutions uh, that are available to you. Uh, you see Koch University and there's also a different code for the Koch University Graduate School of Business, so be mindful of that. Um, and that's pretty much about sending your scores. Now, Regarding the official scores, so those are the unofficial that we just spoke about, they will be sent to you 10 to 15 days after the test uh, day. Um, again, as I mentioned earlier, the ETS account is where you will find them, so keep that safe. Um, and if you hadn't 
send them to universities yet. So you said, I don't want to rely on the unofficial scores. I want to wait for the official scores to send them. Then from your ETS account, you can send them additionally to universities of your choice. Um, now, in uh, some situations, unfortunately, during uh, the test or when you attempt to, to give the test, you uh, don't have a great day. Maybe you're not feeling well. Um, maybe you had to travel for a couple of hours to take the test, etc., etc. It may happen that you didn't give your best performance, but don't worry, you can retake the test if this uh, is the case. We hope not, but there is a plan B, so to say. Um, so you can test once every 21 days, up to five times within uh, one year, let's say, uh, for uh, the matter of simplicity. Uh, so you have to wait 21 days and you can register for retaking the test once again. Um, for those of you who need to retake it, but also for those who are just curious how you did on the test, we offer something uh, called the GRE Diagnostic Service. So after your scores are available, you can find it again in your ETS account. Um, and you can see really a breakdown of your performance. You can see within each section, it's actually a lot more detailed than the screen capture I have here, but you can see, did you uh, answer wrong or right? How long did you spend? How, how much time? Was the difficulty level of that question one, two, three, or four, et cetera, et cetera. So you can really break down your performance and understand where you may need a little bit more preparation. Even if you were successful on your test, before you go to graduate school, maybe you need to brush up on a couple of uh, skills. Um, and now I'm coming to um, the tools to help you prepare. This is one of my favorite sections because um, we offer a lot of free of charge preparation tools. So the only thing that uh, you have to do is create your ETS account, but there's no commitment in that. Um, you don't, uh, you know, uh, sign up for the test in any way or nothing like that. You create your ETS account and you can access all of these wealth of resources available for you. And the first one is the Power Prep tool. So this is essentially a booklet or a resource that contains information to help you familiarize yourself with the test question. So what I mentioned earlier, right? You don't want to be wasting time on that test features, help tools, et cetera, et cetera. Um, so this is one of them. The other preparation too, this is uh, my favorite of all of them that are available for free. It's called the Power Prep Practice Test. Essentially what that is, those are two free GRE tests for you to take. They're again, completely free of charge and it's the real test. It's not the test questions uh, as in pilot questions. It's the real questions you will see on your Jerry test officially. Uh, and one of the tests, I believe the second one is even timed. So, you know, when you have prepared yourself, when you feel confident, you can take the second test under the, the real examination conditions and understand how you're doing with time, with pacing, etc. My advice to many of you who are thinking, um, should I take the GRE or maybe a different test or I don't know how long I need to prepare. My advice always is take the first test to understand really what the level is. What are the questions asking you? Take the first test, assess your skills, assess how much preparation you need. And then when you have prepared yourself, come back and do the second test, which is actually time and can help you uh, really understand if your preparation has been um, in the right direction. Um, once again, this is completely free of charge. A couple of other resources. So some of you may have been away from school for a while uh, or math, maybe it's not your strong suit. You may want to review it a little bit. Those are two resources that we allow, uh, that we make available for free, the math review and the math conventions with formulas, symbols, terminology, et cetera, et cetera. It's all on there and it's all free of charge in your ETS account. 
Uh, now, I also wanted to mention something. We do have a lot of accessible options. Uh, so if some of you or somebody else you know uh, requires extra accommodations, for example, extended time or extra break due to some uh, learning difficulties or whatever the case may be, we have a lot of these available. So uh, please get in touch with us and request them. We have listed all, all the availabilities in Braille, recorded audio, large print, et cetera, et cetera. Um, so uh, that's another resources for those that may need it. Uh, okay. All right. Um, I wanted to just give you a nudge to get in touch with us or connect with us on Facebook, Instagram, LinkedIn. There's a lot of uh, resources available from test takers. So not from us only, but from those that have already went down this road and can share uh, tips, how it went for them, et cetera, et cetera. On YouTube, we have some videos as well. For example, how to register, how to send your test course. They're quick two to three minute videos, really easy to, to um, uh, digest, uh, very instructional. So head there if you need some additional uh, support or information. Uh, and this is the end of my for, uh, the, uh, the end of my presentation. I know I went really, really fast, which I apologize for, uh, but I still hope the presentation was um, uh, of value. Um, and now I have uh, actually uh, a few sample questions, um, and I will share at least one of them with you. Okay, let's see. Um, Okay, let's share this one. This is from the quantitative reasoning. Again, you see the screen, the official GRE uh, testing screen. And the question is asking you, a car got 33 miles per gallon using gasoline that cost 295 US dollars per gallon. Approximately what was the cost in dollars of the gasoline used in driving the car 350 miles? Now, if you want to tell us your suggested answer, and, and bear in mind, see at the bottom of the screen, you have to select one answer choice. So in some questions, we'll ask you to select two answer choices or else. So always read the prompt because you don't want to make um, mistakes that are very, very avoidable. Um, if you would like to share your thoughts on the correct answer, please do so in the chat box. You, the, of course, this is not graded or it's not going to impact in any way. Um, anything is just I wanted to share with you uh, pretty much what the questions looked like. Um, and the correct answer is 30. I hope that wasn't too difficult. So uh, I want to congratulate Muna and Chan Su because they got the right answer. <laughs> Oh, that's they, they wonderful. Type, yeah, they wrote on the chat. That's really wonderful. Congratulations. Well, you are definitely in the in the right way. And hopefully that gives you a little bit of confidence that the GRE, yes, it's it's a difficult exam. Yes, it requires preparation, but it's by far not impossible and unattainable. If you just prepare yourself, you will definitely uh, make progress and get there. Um, okay, I think I would like to stop here um, because um, I, I'm not sure if we got some questions already coming yes. in. Okay, perfect. So what I suggest we can do, I'm going to switch our screens. Yes. That's okay. Sure. Okay. All right. So um, we are now at four o'clock. So we have, I think it was worth maybe, um, you know, extending a bit and we still want to make sure we answer your questions. I have tried to start answering them on the Q&A in the answered section. Mm -hmm. um, I left a couple of questions open because I want to answer them live. Um, some of your questions, which were more about uh, whether we have specific programs or about migration, like residence permit, um, I have already answered, so I'm not going to read those. However, um, I want to address some that are related specifically about the GRE um, score. So we had one question from Kian says, um, can I only include my GRE quantitative grades without the verbal part grades on the application form? Because the program which I'm interested in only has you know, standards or minimums for the quantitative part? That's a great question. Um, the answer is no, you should include all of your GRE, the three 
um, scores that you will receive uh, because we need that for all of our applicant file records. The professors who will be evaluating you may only pay attention, let's say, to the quantitative section, uh, but you should include all of them on the application form. And you should make sure also there was a related question whether you should answer all sections of the test when you're doing the test, and the answer is yes, you should do all, all sections, okay? It just means yes, you just you need to prepare properly for each section. There was another question. Um, there are some questions about when do we start our programs if you get your diplomas from your universities a bit late in July or if your or your academic year ends in September. Uh, these are not really barriers. Uh, in terms of the diploma, you don't need to upload your diploma. You need to upload your transcript. So we know that you may get your diploma much later. We know this is the case, for example, for, for applicants in Iran. That's one example that we know well about. Um, but as long as you have official transcripts of your university showing at least until the first semester of your last year, that should be okay. And importantly, your grade point average until then, your combined grade point average. Um, there was a question for our MBA program. Uh, here, I think we have focused more on our research, like master with thesis and PhD programs, but for our non-thesis masters, for example, our MBA program, to apply, you don't need to have a GRE test score or a TOEFL test score. You can apply with your CV, your transcripts, your references, and your essays, like your motivation and essays. Um, but if you are shortlisted for an interview and following the interview, the, the admissions committee considers that you need to show some further proof of specially written, um, like, uh, you know, writing and reading English comprehension and proficiency, they may ask you to then provide a TOEFL test score before you enroll. So it would be a conditional admission saying you can enroll as a student if you bring by September or during the first semester, a TOEFL test score with a minimum score of 80 or higher. If you want to be considered for a scholarship for our MBA program, then you do need to bring a GRE test score or a GMAT test score, because again, um, there are very few or very limited scholarships for our executive MBA and our MBA program. So they want to make sure uh, they're based on academic merit and they want to give them to the best students academically. So they will take your bachelor grades into consideration plus your standard test scores into consideration. So that's, that's the answer. In terms of the open questions that we have here, um, so there's one, can, can we submit the test scores after submitting the application? Yes, you can, but our recommendation is try not to submit them too late after um, the deadline. So for example, if the program application deadline is 5th of June and you have submitted your application, let's say a week before, you know, 1st of June, late May, that's fine. Um, what you should try is to make sure that you upload your test score not more than a month after the deadline, because in that first month is when all of our faculty members are on the system checking the applicant. So if they check your application and you don't have um, that missing, you know, if, if that document, let's say that information is missing, then they're going to put your application on hold. They're, they're going to wait basically until you have that. And in the meantime, they will continue evaluating other applicants. In the case of PhD programs, this is critical because they, for example, an individual faculty member in social sciences and humanities, um, per year, they cannot supervise, you know, they cannot take on, for example, uh, four or five students. They typically will take one or two new PhD students. So if whilst, you know, they're waiting for you to upload your missing test scores, they have gone through the interview rounds with other applicants and they consider them to be very good. They want to make an offer. They make an offer, the candidates accept. It means that there's no more quota left. There's no, no more space. So that's why we insist in making sure that you try to apply with your test scores already, you know, ready to be seen and, and presented or submit them just after the application deadline if possible. Um, 
that's and especially in social sciences so that's why um we're you know we want to make sure you have the best chances of, of being admitted basically so uh let's see uh there's a question here it's a long question which i think it's it's great because we, we <laughs> i've heard that argument i had that argument in my head when i was applying to graduate programs um in the uk many many years ago uh it's and it touches on two things one is why are our graded graduate admissions so serious or so um complex <laughs> in the in, in the sense of uh, you need to have gre TOEFL, a high GPA, academic papers, um, why? You know, if our university ranking is not in the top 100 universities worldwide. Um, so it touches on two things, you know, the complexity of admissions and rankings. I would say when you're deciding on where to study as a graduate student, my advice uh, is do not choose a university based on rankings. Rankings can help you identify maybe good universities in the countries you are interested in or curious about, but your most, I mean, the, I think the most important criteria, if you're gonna do a master's or PhD is the faculty members, really. It's who is going to be your supervisor, who is going to be teaching courses and especially who could be a supervisor for the topic or topics that you're interested in. Because um, it's that supervision that is going to make a really big difference in terms of what you do with that degree after. Uh, it's their recommendation letters that are gonna make a difference if you're planning on doing a PhD after a master's in terms of what, what universities you can go after with that PhD or after you do a PhD, what type of postdoctoral positions you can apply to or even apply as you know to be an academician in other universities or you know, a government position. So I think what really matters when you're choosing a graduate program, it's, it shouldn't be only the ranking. And of course, the ranking shouldn't determine how complex or difficult admissions are. In our case, as I said, you know, we are offering full scholarships automatically to all admitted students to pretty much all our master with thesis and PhD programs. This is not a common thing. This is in, in one way, this is very unique within the context of Turkey and the region. Um, so our professors are trying to, again, make sure that the scholarships and the opportunity are gonna go to the best candidates. And because they have to evaluate candidates from lots of different countries, some of, and, and they may not be familiar with the, the quality of universities in every country, they use test scores like GRE to, to basically be fair, to evaluate everyone on the same, you know, from the same uh, starting point, let's say. So I do get your point. Uh, it takes time, it's a headache, um, especially if you're applying for social sciences or humanities, you may think, why do I need to take a quantitative analysis test <laughs> if I'm not going to be applying or be using this in some of my courses? Um, that's a valid question, but that's a system that we have in place, essentially. So I hope that answers your question. I know it's complex. Uh, on the other end, there is a full scholarship with full support. So you know, there, there are some hurdles to, to jump over. By the way, the university you have gotten a scholarship from is one of our partner universities. So we do receive exchange students, both at undergraduate and graduate level. Uh, from that university. So if you wish to come as an exchange student during, during if you decide to go to, uh, to that university, you're more than welcome to do that. Okay, um, let's see. I'm gonna check in the questions on the Q&A. So for our industrial engineering and operations management PhD program, yes, it does require GRE and TOEFL. IELTS, by the way, I'm just going to mention this briefly, is not accepted in Turkey by the Higher Education Council of Turkey. So it's not a, related to our university specifically. It's a national decision from our university's regulator. So please be aware of that. Some universities can accept your IELTS test scores in Turkey as part of the application, though. If you already have taken the test and you have a score above the minimum, you can include it, but you will still need to take a one of the other eligible tests for English. Um, okay. 
So do you offer any master program that does not require TOEFL or GRE GMAT at all? Uh, yes, so those would be, for example, our master non-thesis program. So programs that do not require you to write a dissertation or a master's. Some examples are our master's in data science, master's in cybersecurity, our LLM program in law, if you graduated from law, um, our master's in global health. Uh, so the, the non-thesis programs typically do not require this test, or master's in finance or master's in international management. So yes, there are options if you don't don't want, like so you refuse completely to take the test, that, that, that's also understandable. Okay, so I'm gonna mark this as answered. There's a question. I receive 150 score in my GRE score. However, 155 is the minimum requirement. Do you suggest to submit my application with the 150 score since the evaluation starts in two days? Um, I, so I think you're referring, yes, to our, uh, it's probably for a program in sciences and engineering. I would suggest that if possible, um, yes, try to take the exam again and obtain a score higher than, than 155. And you can, again, indicate in your application that you will be taking the test again, make a note so that the evaluators know that, you know, you're submitting this, but you are going to take the test again. Okay, hope that that helps. Um, there's a question about Okay, about our biomedical engineering science and other programs. So for our graduate school of sciences and engineering, they have a June this year, they have a June 5th deadline, but they are also taking applications on a rolling basis, meaning that's why you will see the August 31st deadline on the application system. It means that any, anyone who applied until June 5th will be evaluated you know, during June and July, interviewed, et cetera. And then if offered admission, it would be offered admission for the fall semester. If you apply after June 5th, for example, in the middle of July or in the middle of August, you your application will be evaluated, but it will be evaluated for the next admission period, which would be in spring. So that's how they like to process. They don't want to stop anyone from submitting their application but they do have to put, they do need to have a cutoff date to then evaluate that specific group and then move to the to the next group. Um, so there's a question here. I'm applying for a PhD in, in computer sciences and engineering. Must I have GRE before I apply? Um, yes, the answer is, I think is yes, because we do receive a lot of applications for that PhD program. And again, the, the candidates that we'll look at first are those that have a complete application. That complete application means that it includes a GRE test scores. Um, chances of getting admitted, we can't comment on that, unfortunately, on an individual basis, but typically, you know, professors are looking at uh, candidates, they would like to work, let's say, with candidates who have high grades in their bachelor's, relevant experience, some research experience, if possible. Any publications are always a plus, a good level of English, good recommendation letters, and a well-written statement of purpose. We have guides on our website, by the way. Um, I will type our website on the chat before we finish, in which we have uh, guidance on how to write strong statements of purpose. We have samples from admitted students. So we have a lot of resources also on our website about the other elements of the application. All right, um, there is a question in French and I'm so sorry, but <laughs> if someone can help me with that, that would be great. I used, I used to know French, but I don't feel confident enough nowadays after many years to to do that, to try to translate that. Um, how much does a higher GRE score, so verbal 155, quantitative 165, affect on the holistic admissions process? That's a very good question. Um, if your program specifically says um, that they will consider the quantitative uh, analysis section, and you have a high score there, of course, it means that, you know, when compared to a similar applicant that has your same credentials in terms of GPA, um, your degree, um, good references, good motivation letters, sometimes it may be the GRE scores that puts you above in the 
priority of candidates that they have for interview. So uh, it, it does help, okay? Do you offer scholarships for the master's in immunology without thesis? What is the GPA requirement? Um, we have a master's in immunology with thesis and without thesis. For the master's in immunology with thesis, there are scholarships and they're based on merit, but there isn't a specific GPA requirement. For the master's without thesis, there are no scholarships. Is GRE required for international relations? Yes for both the master with thesis and for the PhD program. Do we need to contact supervisors before applying to ensure application success? Uh, not necessarily. Um, what I would recommend is, for example, if you check the program website, you check who are the faculty members and the research topics they're interested in. Once you make a short list of which professors you would like to work with because they align with your interests, you can check their websites and on their websites, some of them will say directly, please contact me before you apply and send me your CV. And others say, please do not contact me before you apply. So it depends on, you know, it varies between professors. What we recommend though, is that you reflect that you have done proper research about the program in your statement of purpose, because in the statement of purpose, you can specifically say, you know, I would like to be supervisor to work with Professor X or Y because they're working on X, Y, and Z topics which are aligned with the background that I have and that I want to now develop into. You know, the more specific and technical you can go, the better. So you can mention which professors you want to work with. Um, you do not need to have formal approval from them to apply. So I know that there are some universities in Europe, uh, for example, in the Netherlands, I think in Germany, they, you need to have a um, supervisor's approval to apply and to be evaluated. That's not the case at Coach University. Okay, let me just check the time. Um, so, so um, just a final question about our GPAs in our application form. Uh, what we mean by uh, GPA average grade, that's your score. So that, that's how much you have accumulated or obtained after your, your years of, of a bachelor's degree or a master's degree. Maximum GPA, I think there's a typo there, but basically we need to know on what scale is your university uh, grading you. So if it's on a scale of 100 or four or five or 20 or whichever the scale is. So based on that, then, then the graded schools do a conversion to our grading scale, which is uh, out of four. Just same, it's the same scale as uh, for US universities. Okay, uh, I think we have more questions, but I think we're gonna have to now finish. Um, Okay, for just last question for a PhD in chemistry, do you need a GRE? Yes, so it's similar to the question about industrial engineering and operations management. Um, okay, so let's see. And I know there's also some questions in the chat, which I hope I have also covered. Um, can we apply for a PhD for a master's degree? Is it still in progress? Yes, you can apply. You just need to make sure you upload you know, the latest version of transcripts that you have available. The same thing, you can apply for an MS degree if your bachelor degree is still in progress. Of course, typically um, students would apply to a master's during their final year of their bachelor degree and not before, okay? So if, if you're on a four year bachelor's degree, you, apply, you apply there in your fourth year um, or if it's a three year degree, or if a fifth, it depends on the, on the system that you're studying in. Um, regarding application fees, I just want to clarify because there are some questions here. None of our graduate programs have an application fee. The only programs that do are in the graduate school of business. So this would be our MBA, master's in finance, master's in management. Those are the only ones that have an application fee. Um, there was a question also about waiving the, the fee for GRE. And Maria, would you like to answer that? I mean, from our part as a university, we don't have any um, like GRE exam fee um, feature or, or option, let's say. So 
we know that it can be expensive depending on the country that you're in. Um, what we see candidates do is that they save for some time to pay for the for the exam fee, and then during this time they're preparing for the test as well. From uh, my side, unfortunately, I don't have better news either in the sense that we don't offer any waivers. Um, we don't offer any reductions or anything of that sort. Uh, that's why, uh, as I mentioned during my presentation, try to register early or at least to get oriented of what the price would be so then you can budget that in your finance. Uh, the prices of the GRE test are available online and we actually have three different price categories. Um, they differ slightly only, but still it's good to know. Uh, one fee for China, one fee for India, and the rest of the world is falling in a third category. Um, and I can actually copy the link to all this information in uh, here in the chat, just so you can already start reviewing it and preparing yourselves for those who are still to register. Okay. Thank you, Maria. Uh, we had a question about references. Can we add a new reference after sending the application? Uh, yes, you can go on to your application form and you can add a new referee and then you click on the button to send them a reference request. Just make sure that you're not doing that too late after the application deadline, because as I said, you know, professors start looking at the applications just after the, the deadline. So you want to make sure that they have not already checked your your file. Also, if you know if you added a referee and then they decided not to give you a reference, you can also untick them from the application. You know the reference section. You can untick them and add you know and add a new referee to your list of two or three referees. So I hope that helps. I'm just scanning quickly to see any other questions we may not have um, written or answered here. I think not so. Okay, so with that, I think we're going to close today's webinar. Uh, thank you so much again, all of you for joining us from all different countries. I hope it has been useful. I want to thank again, Maria Kirilova from GRE to, for joining us and giving us a really practical uh, information session that I think we will, I hope you all go now to the ETS, the GRE website, the official website and check all of the resources. There really a lot of, there's a lot of information there. Uh, so take your time. And if you have any questions after today, I'm going to put here our, oh, sorry. So this is just a very quick um, overview of our upcoming program deadlines. And we also have a lot of upcoming information sessions for specific programs between April, May, and even late in June for some of our business programs. So you can find all of this on our international admissions website. I will put the address here now. And again, if you still want to discuss anything specifically about your application, if you have any questions, you can email us. You can also book an, an one on one session on Zoom with our team. Uh, we have that calendar kind of book a calendar meeting on our website. You can do that. And of course, check our YouTube channel if you can subscribe because we are putting all of these videos regularly there. So with that, I want to thank you again and we're going to close today's webinar. Any parting words, Maria? Thank you once again so much for having me. It was a pleasure speaking with everyone and I really hope it was useful. Great. Thank you very much. So have a, a great weekend, everyone, wherever you are and stay safe and, and healthy and just not non-COVID. <laughs> okay. Bye-bye, <laughs> everyone. Bye.